Anyway, it's my honor now to, to introduce Kathy Kelly, um, who I've known for many years. She's a peace activist whose efforts have sometimes led to her living in war zones. Are we at Kathy there somewhere? Yes. Okay. Anyway, oh, there she is. Hi, Kathy. Um, uh, war zones and prisons. Believing where you stand determines what you see. Kathy and her companions have lived in war zones alongside ordinary people in Iraq, Afghanistan, Gaza, Lebanon, Bosnia, and Nicaragua. During the Cold War, she was arrested dozens of times for resisting U.S. intervention in Central America, was sentenced to one year in prison for nuclear disarmament action. She planted corn on a nuclear missile silo site and became a lifelong war tax refuser. And um, I was at with Kathy one year at the Fort Benning at the School of America's protest, and Kathy went through the fence onto Fort Benning, and I remember her. And Kathy's not a big person, <laughs> and they roughed her up really bad. The, the soldiers, the police, roughed her up real bad. And Kathy asked them, "Why are you, why are you doing this to me? I'm not resisting." And then she went to jail. But when Kathy goes to jail, she organizes. So anyway, I, I love you, Kathy. It's my honor to introduce Kathy Kelly, everybody. Well, hello, and thank you. Um, thank you, Frank, for that introduction. Thank you to everybody who has participated. What an um, important and crucial time it is to um, be receivers of this education and, of course, to be active. You know, um, Frank had written and said, please say something about Yemen. And so I, I want to start by saying that I was very surprised to see that the Saudi Kingdom, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has hired consulting companies well beyond Washington, D.C. and New York in places like Maine and North Carolina, Des Moines, Iowa. And their strategy is to improve the image of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who has gone on Saudi TV to say that the long, hideous war in Yemen is actually in their favor. They want to improve this image amongst people whom they're pretty sure really never heard of Yemen in the first place and who wouldn't really be troubled by the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Well, um, I think that's a signal to us of how important the work you're doing today is to be able to go out to the heartland and make sure people do know where Yemen is and what's happening in Yemen, and that the people in Yemen are no threat whatsoever to people in the United States. Earlier, um, Daniel Ellsberg had talked about how the uh, annual subsidization of aerospace industry goes on in the United States and greatly benefits companies like Raytheon. He mentioned that uh, Raytheon now will have the contract to install new nuclear weapons, underground intercontinental ballistic nuclear weapons. And uh, these will bring enormous, enormous rewards financially to the Raytheon Corporation and other subsidiary groups. And uh, Daniel Ellsberg just kind of begged people, uh, don't let this happen. We should be organizing regionally to try and prevent it. And um, as Frank mentioned, I. Um, well, my first lengthy imprisonment, well, not lengthy compared to the hideous long sentences that are handed out to so many people, but I did spend a year in prison for planting corn on top of nuclear missile silo sites. And I think it is crucial for us to resist this ground-based defense or deterrent strategy that um, it is completely dependent on people believing that we should be afraid of Russia, we should be afraid of China, we have to enter into a new Cold War. And of course, what we actually so much need when the greatest terror we all face is the threat of what we're doing to our own environment, what we desperately need is an enhanced capacity to cooperate, to collaborate with Russia and with China, to be learning their languages, to be better understanding cultures to see what kinds of problems they mainly face, to see how scientifically we can join our resources and our abilities, and particularly not only facing climate catastrophe, but also a time of pandemic and with 
rising numbers of people fleeing from the various wars that we've started. So um, sort of as a, a, a tale that I think points us in a, 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 such a different direction. I want to speak briefly about people in a village in Yemen called Ahab. And these were people who were um, poor, rural um, farmers, uh, herders, and they were in great troubles because they were running out of water. Their flocks were thirsting to death and they couldn't irrigate their crops. And so they did something that was risky, but so very uh, needed, uh, or, or they all might not survive. They pooled their resources and they collectively hired a, a rig so that they could dig and dig down deeper into the earth and hope to hit water. Well, they weren't successful at first and it got to be uh, very, very agonizing. They thought, well, we've you know, given money we didn't have or borrowed money. Now we're going to find out that this was a wasted project or maybe we've been uh, conned by an unfair group. Anyway, one night finally, they hit water and it was like Eureka. They had a wonderful celebration. People danced and they sang into the wee hours of the morning. And as they were sort of heading back to their homes, um, well, some had heard that the Saudis were in the habit of bombing wells in Yemen. But they thought, well, we're so removed from any place that's strategic or crucial. Nobody's going to waste a bomb on us, but they were wrong. Coming from Arizona, a Raytheon manufactured bomb was dropped by a Saudi pilot. It dangled in the air on a fuse. And then when that fuse is cut, three fins sprout out, the bomb comes to life. And that bomb hurtled down to exactly where those people celebrating having collectively found water had been heading back home. And immediately when the bomb's nose count hits the ground, then that releases two tons of explosives. The shards of the bomb travel eight times the speed of light. If such a shard were to hit your body, you could be disemboweled, you could be decapitated, your limbs could be cut off from your torso. And this is what happened to the revelers who were celebrating having hit water. Jeffrey Stern, with people uh, what he'd what the bomb had done to them. He spoke with a particular man who took his hand and put his hand on his cheek and Jeffrey Stern felt the presence of metal in the man's cheekbone and in his forehead. And he said it was an amazing thing to have traveled from Arizona to Point us collectively toward working constantly to put an end to war, to wean ourselves out of the military industrial congressional media complex, and to find ways to deal with the real terrors we face, the terror of what we're doing to our own environment. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, so much. Um, Okay, we're someone's freezing sometimes. Um